Children's Hospital Medical Center, Cincinnati, representing excellence in pediatric health care since 1883. Home of major developments and discoveries, including the heart-lung machine, the science of teratology, the oral polio vaccine, artificial blood, new lung surfactant replacement. Today, the largest pediatric facility in the nation, Children's also has the largest pediatric residency training program within a single institution. Through its affiliation with the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, Children's staff serves as the faculty for the university's Department of Pediatrics. One of the nation's leading pediatric research facilities, Children's today is a major tertiary care and referral center, treating patients from every state and many foreign countries. Its mission is to provide the best possible patient care, education, and research. To preserve our medical history, Children's Hospital Medical Center has produced a series of interviews with distinguished medical faculty. For information on rental or purchase of Medical Heritage Series tapes, please write or call Children's Hospital Research Foundation Library, Elland and Bethesda Avenues, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45229-2899, area code 513-559-4300. Hello, this, I'm Dr. Leonard Siegel, the current director of the Cincinnati Drug and Poison Information Center. And the purpose of this tape today is to give you a history uh, of the poison control programs in Cincinnati, which date back to the 50s, and to give you a little bit of a feeling about uh, where we are today and where we may be going in the future. And to do this, there are three of us here today, in addition to myself, there's Dr. Jules Klein, who is the original chairperson of the first Poison Control Committee in Cincinnati, and Dr. Suman Wasson, a, an American uh, Board of Medical Toxicology certified clinical toxicologist who brought the Center and Poison Control Services into the most current uh, era uh, in 1983 and we'll be hearing more from him about uh, what has evolved since that time period. In October of this year, the Cincinnati Drug and Poison Information Center celebrated its 25th anniversary with a gala event downtown. But that uh, figure of 25 years is a little bit misleading because what has happened is there has been a simultaneous uh, evolution of basically two services, one drug information and the other poison information and poison control over the years. That 25th anniversary was of the Drug Information Center established in 1966, which added to its responsibilities in 1972 the responsibility of being the poison control center for this area. But poison control services existed in Cincinnati before that time and to begin with then today, we're going to have Dr. Jules Klein tell us about the origin of poison control services in Cincinnati. Then you'll see a videotape that was prepared for the 25th anniversary dinner that will describe the services provided between 1966 and 1991. And then we'll have a general discussion about the whole past, current time period, and future of poison control in this area. So I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Klein at this moment to give us the origins of poison control in Cincinnati. Well, I really am, <clears throat> am very thrilled to be here. And as I said before, when we started to talk, that I really get a shiver when I think back to the year of 1956 that this started. Actually, my interest in my personal interest in it started long before that. Uh, I go back quite a while in graduates to when I graduated, and I was in practice in um, West Virginia for a while, which is my home state. And it was there that I used to see where they had a lot of outhouses, uh, different caustic acid preparations that they used to clean 
the outhouses with. And of course, we get calls with kids who swallow these accidentally. And what do you do with them? They don't prepare you for that in medical school. Uh, and that became of an interest to me <coughs> then. But as, uh, <coughs> as you mentioned, and it's true, the first poison control center was, was um, started in 1956. And the reason for that is that the um, Cincinnati, <coughs> excuse me, Cincinnati Pediatric Society was started in 1956. And Dr. Clyde Dummer was the first president. And because of my interest in this from the time when I came back after the war in 1945, we here in Cincinnati used to see the same thing. They were cleaning the bowls with caustic acid type preparations. And we'd get calls, what do we do? And you would tell the mother if it was a preparation that could be used, uh, take some syrup of Ipecac. Syrup of Ipecac, what is that? Is that in with the groceries? What is it? Nobody knew what it was. And I realized that uh, individually, we had to educate them as to what it was. And then there was a problem of when to use it. Because we all know you don't give syrup Ipecac all the time. So it wasn't only myself, but all the individual uh, pediatricians. And in that th those days, it was not group practice. You practiced by yourself, and you talked in the halls about the problems, and you tried to figure them out. So when they uh, formed a society, I decided that uh, we should also start what we call a poison control center. And I made a motion that the society uh, take upon itself the responsibility of organizing a poison control center. I must also say that there was a pediatrician by the name of Bob Cotty who was here, a very lovely man. We always, in those days, you went by alphabets. KK sat in each other, so we know each other from Klein and Cotty. And he was interested in this too. And he co-sponsored with me. So it was started then. Well, what is a poison control center? All you can do is you hope that we have a place that can organize some kind of a central place where parents can call and say, what do I do? Um, well, you, Clyde says, well, who, who's going to do it? You know, a children's hospital was not equipped to do that. The meeting, by the way, was in the library. And that has a special place to me because that's where the Pediatric Society started. And that's where a lot of the things that are doing now has its beginning in January of 1956. Clyde Demmer, I must say, was a great, great guy, an organizer. And he knew how to organize a society, which he did. Uh, so uh, Big Mouth Klein had to say, of course, well, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And what it turned out to be, guys, really was that it was in a basement of my house. And I had a um, separate phone down there. And whenever they called, they, the patients, would call, what do I do? Uh, we were down, we'd go down there after dinner, whenever it was, and we'd take some calls, or my wife would accumulate it, and even got to the point where my kids knew when the poison control <laughs> center was starting, and they knew enough to take the number and call back. It was really the kind of thing where we'd tell them to um, make sure that they don't get any more, take it out, uh, give Ipecac or don't give Ipecac, and they wouldn't be fair now to go through a whole list of things. But through our, as we all know, again, sometimes you use it for cat, sometimes you don't. Well, but they don't have it. So what do you do? So there was a drugstore on the corner of Clinton, Clinton Road, Clinton Avenue and Reading Road. And it was called Glick's. A man by the mm -hmm. name of Harry Glick was there. And he had a pharmacy, and a very lovely guy, too. And uh, I went to Harry, and I proposed to him would he give a reduced rate, one ounce of Ipecac, to people if when they call up and said, said that they had trouble, uh, get some Ipecac, would he sell them some Ipecac at a reduced rate? Well, he lent me one better. He said, yes, and if they can't afford a jewels, I'll give it to them. And that was the beginning, and I shiver when I tell it to you, really, the beginning of the Ipecac. There was another drugstore up the street called Lowenthal's. And I went to Mari Lowenthal, and I told him Harry Glick was doing it. And he said, well, if Harry does it, we'll do it too. And there was a one on the corner that, uh, near this area here, on the corner of um, Bernard Avenue and Erkenbecker. There was a drugstore mm -hmm. there. There are little stores there now. There was one there. Anyhow, those three drugstores, uh, if they couldn't afford it, we didn't tell them. We told them to go get it. Uh, later on, we did. 
and they would give it. And that was the beginning of the syrup of Ipecac. And we would tell them all to have it on hand. Uh, so each year we had meetings, and each year we would interest another uh, person of big in practice that he should come in on the committee. And Bob and I really carried it along. There was also, we were fortunate to have a very, very uh, lovely member of the faculty that I think both of you know, or you know, not know, but you know his name, Bob Lyons, mm -hmm. who started almost everything in this community. And Bob was interested in it. And that's how I got Children's Hospital interested, because I said, Bob, I think Children's has some responsibility too. And it didn't happen in 56. Bob Cotty became president of the uh, Cincinnati Pediatric Society in 1961. And when he became president in 1961, uh, I really gave him the leadership at that time. My kids objected to it because they said, you mean we're not going to answer the phone anymore? We're not, mm -hmm. not going to be able to tell patients what to do and things. They didn't officially do it, as you well know. Uh, but anyhow, at that time, also I had become uh, director of the um, new pediatric department at, at um, Jewish Hospital. We just started one there. And the reason I mention that is not for any personal reason, is because that was 19, I forget, in the late 50s, early 60s. But because of that, uh, I decided that um, it was time that the hospitals got interested too. And being in charge of the Jewish Hospital Pediatric Department uh, was a committee appointed to have a poison control center that would have charge of all the poison cases that appeared in the in the uh, recovery in the emergency room, but I also want to bring in Don Frank, who I don't know whether you know him or know that name. Don had given up private practice to go start the Good Samaritan Pediatric Department, which still is in existence under the neonatology and perinatology. But I got Don interested in that, and so they started. Good Sam started. There was no pediatric department in any of the others. Christ in Bethesda was just a hospital. It was just starting up in the late 50s and early 60s. It really wasn't uh, organized to the extent that it is now. We also had, believe it or not, a Deaconess Hospital involved. And as you know now, Deaconess is not any pediatrically oriented at all. But we got that into it, interested in that too. Uh, well, after we got started on the Children's Hospital, <coughs> it was logical. And the pictures that you show me of, uh, of uh, Alan Robinson and of Manny Doyne answering phones there, that's, of course, after when they picked it up. Mm -hmm. And Bob took care of it, if I remember correctly. Bob took care of the uh, poison control problems of the city, particularly of, children, of, um, of the Cincinnati Pediatric Society, places like that, until approximately the late 60s. And then it was turned over to Children's Hospital. There was a period in between there, too, that we tried to get the um, Academy of Medicine interested in it. And uh, they did. But it was not, I won't use the word I was going to, it was not a very successful mm -hmm. venture. We had to take it back, Pediatric Society, get Children's interested in it again. And from then on, it went on to the time that I think into the late 70s when all these were organized. That they, It was far beyond anything that the committee had started way back in January of 1956. I must also say, for history's sake, really more than anything else, if I'm talking too much. I'm not at all. all. Um, that I had the good fortune, I had some of my training in Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. And there was a man by the name of Dr. Paul Hollinger. And Hollinger, Dr. Hollinger was the first Midwest uh, bronchoscopist mm. of the United States, if he wasn't of the whole world, really, in the sense that he trained in Philadelphia. And I can't recall the name of the bronchoscopist who uh, taught him, but he decided to come practice in um, Chicago, and he started Children's Memorial Hospital. And why I bring him in is a part of our training there was as pediatrics. So I went, I interned at the General 
excuse me, university hospital, <laughs> at the university hospital here, uh, and then um, went to Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. And while we were there, part of our training was that we uh, had to hold the head of the patient while Dr. Hollinger was doing the bronchoscopy. And then he let us not do it, but he let us get the feel of putting that in. And I only tell you that not for any personal reasons again, but these were children who uh, had swallowed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they were having problems. They had regurgitated and had gone from the esophagus to the other. I also was remembered now that I mentioned that, I'm shivering again. Um, what really made me get started, I think, in the, did this in 56, is we had several cases that we would admit to the hospital here of kids who had swallowed. Uh, we made them vomit when they shouldn't vomit. Uh, they got irritation in the esophagus. They had to have gastrostomies. And tragically, they also had to have tracheostomies mm -hmm. because it had gone down into the trachea. There wasn't anybody here that was doing that, but Paul Hollinger in um, Chicago was doing it. And we talked about it here. And one little darling girl, Allison, that did it when she was 15 months old. And I followed Allison until she was almost three years old. And she had her tracheostomy tube in. And every time we tried to close it off, it just didn't work. And in spite of that, that little girl didn't let it hinder her development from her one year to her two years to her three years in her family. They had no money, but they got it some way. She was readmitted to the hospital, out of the hospital, read, and nothing but a smile, nothing but a smile. And she is part of my background. And I don't know that I have a smile that much, but I think it's all due to Allison, as we all pick up when we get exposed to these kind of situations. Um, I think that probably is pretty much... James, what I find interesting is you say you started in 1956, and I wanted to come back to ask you a couple of questions mm -hmm. on that. But, in fact, it was the mid-50s that the American Academy of Pediatrics, based in Chicago, decided that there was a need for a poison mm -hmm. control movement. Mm -hmm. And it appears to me that, that your starting this uh, was probably as soon after or maybe even just before the mandate came down from the Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I find that interesting. It, it tells us again that we have a history of pediatrics in this city that is often unrecognized. The question I had for you is I was intrigued as to how you manned, if you will, the lines. Now, you obviously had a busy practice. You were out seeing patients. Um, and you mentioned that your wife took phone messages, et cetera. Would she call you in the office mm -hmm. sometimes, or sure. uh, yes. tell us a little more First, about let that. me tell you about the reason I bring Paul Hollinger into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize this thing about 1955, and you said the mm -hmm. Academy of Pediatrics. As you know, the Academy of Pediatrics is based in Chicago. In Chicago right. mm -hmm. And you know who was there, don't you? Mm -hmm. Clifford Gruley's father. That's right. Senior. Right. And he was a teacher of mine. Uh -huh. Gruley, and Joseph Brenneman, you know, the man who wrote the book. That's right. Those kind Brenneman's of things. Pediatrics. Right? Yes. And uh, Paul Perlstein's father was one of my teachers. All these men, I'm shivering again, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, were, were my teachers. So when we looked at these people, they were poisoned. They were children who had ingested poisons, of course. And yes, there was awareness of it. I didn't honestly know what the Poison Control Center or what the Academy of Pediatrics was interested in. Mm -hmm. But there was, um, on the outskirts, I'll say, rumbling mm -hmm. that that was it. And I'm sure that probably is how Paul mm -hmm. got interested. And I think that probably spread to me, you know, was mm -hmm. contagious. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe in retrospect, coming from your information, it maybe mm -hmm. had something to do mm -hmm. with interesting me in it, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, as far as the other, my wife didn't want to do it at mm -hmm. first because mm. I told her when I married her, by the way, I said, there are two things you know. You're not a doctor and you know no diagnosis and you don't know any information and you're not going to ever give it over the phone. I think it's changed today, but this mm -hmm. was back, went in practice in 1945. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, 
You know, none of the patient's names. Mm -hmm. You know, none of the patient's names. Again, I don't know whether that's practical nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I had to convince her. She was a pretty um, individual person. I had to convince her. No, she would call me mm -hmm. at the office. Mm -hmm. And they weren't necessary patient, necessarily patients mm -hmm. of mine. And I would call them back immediately, mm -hmm. and then immediately would call Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. So all it was, re and by the way, the, the um, Pediatric Society mm -hmm. knew that this existed so that they would call, mm -hmm. and they would call, and some of them even gave the number directly to my um, office because mm -hmm. I had, uh, we found out who the resident was on mm -hmm. then and they didn't have to do all that. Mm -hmm. So it was a co-op, we were in private practice, mm -hmm. but believe me, we were one big family and there was how no did, competitiveness. How did you publicize that number? How did patients get that number? I don't know, the same way as how do they find Word out. Of mouth. Dr. Mm -hmm. Jules Klein is a pediatrician and mm -hmm. he, is a terrible one, stay away from him, you know. <laughs> How do they right. find out about those kinds mm -hmm. of things? It, it's worried about it. There was no publicity, mm -hmm. whatever right. implications that may mean. There wasn't any. It was, yeah. uh, how many, I'm trying to think how many pediatricians, gosh, maybe there were 12 mm -hmm. pediatricians mm -hmm. at in that town. time. Another man who was very, very generous in his time and his money, he provided money, was a man by the name of J. Victor Greenebaum. You ever heard that name? No, no. J. J. No, no. J. Victor Greenbaum was the first, was the first trained pediatrician in Cincinnati. The other names that you may have heard, Wagner, Okrand, Frank, well, several others, there were about four of them, were all general practitioners that switched to pediatrics with no formal pediatric training. Dr. Greenbaum had Harvard pediatric training. Mm. And he came back here. He got the money. This has nothing to do with poison control. He got the money for children's hospital research from Procter & Gamble. Mm. There was an organization here called the Children's Psychiatric Center, mm -hmm. it disbanded. Dr. Greenbaum got the money for that. He started Baby's Milk Fund. Mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. And I mention this only because he never asked for any recognition and in my judgment was the greatest pediatrician in Cincinnati. A lovely man. Uh, I was practiced in West Virginia and decided after being in Cincinnati, which I call the center of the universe by the way, <laughs> gentlemen, uh, I decided to come back here and this was right after service and there was no place available practice. You couldn't get any place. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Dr. Greenbaum saw me at Children's Hospital and he said, Jules, what are you doing here? And I said, Dr. Greenbaum, I decided I can't stay out of Cincinnati. I'm going to practice here. <clears throat> Good. Where are you going to practice? And I said, that's just it, Dr. Greenbaum. I don't know where to practice. I have no place to go. I can't find an office. He said, you got one now. I look <laughs> at him. You know, what do you mean? He says, I don't use my office from 9 to 12 in the morning. You go there and you use the office from 9 to 12. I come in at 2. He gave me that. Free rent. Mm. No rent. Mm. Well, that's, that's just the kind of, I mm -hmm. emphasize that, but that's the kind of guy I had mm -hmm. to deal with. Some names that uh, you mentioned uh, fascinating to me. You mentioned uh, Dr. Gruley Sr., uh, later his son, of course, dean of the College of Medicine. Today he is currently the executive medical officer of what is now the Drug and Poison Information Center. So is there's, there's right? continuity through the years. See, I'm sure didn't know the that. other thing that I'd heard uh, is that there was some involvement of the Kettering Laboratory oh, yes. in the early days, and could I you describe that? that? Ray was in too. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. You're perfectly right. Again, Ray lived across the street from me. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's how I got him interested in it, and he was uh, he offered everything they could do. You're perfectly right. I'd forgotten about that part, but it was through Ray that uh, they became interested, and it was in this was in the when we were struggling after. Uh, when I got involved with the Jewish Hospital of Pediatric, and Bob Cotty took it over, then he tried to get Children's Hospital. It floundered in there for a while, from Academy of Medicine to Children's to the Kettering, back and forth there. But we never lost uh, a concept that we had to have it, and we weren't going to let it. And I personally, and I didn't. Uh, everybody did. It wasn't. It mm -hmm. wasn't a one-man effort. Those things can't succeed if you exactly. have one man. Mm -hmm. Well, it has to be, even today, you know. Exactly. That. You know that it's more a total community effort. Yeah. yeah, and it has to be. It's just that 
somebody gets interested and starts it and the ball rolls and everybody else picks it up and sees that it's a worthwhile project. And the patients are most appreciative. And of course nowadays, uh, they come in my office now and the first thing they say, well, I just took some of the Ipecac and I did that. And every time they do, of course, to me, it, just, it makes me float yes. when I hear they used Ipecac. They use a half teaspoon, a fourth of a teaspoon. It's part of, of the regular language. And then, of course, the um, mothers today are just uh, as, I'm sorry, guys, but the natural superiority of the female race, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it comes out. They, they do it. They're such, I just don't see the you know the difference between the setup of home situations today and, and what they used to be, and yet they're doing a heck of a good job. I won't use the other word. And the continuity of involvement of the Pediatric Society, I think, is also critically important. To this very day, we were talking earlier about uh, uh, Dr. Doyne, for example, is still on the board of the Drug and Poison Information Center today has been actively involved for years. Dr. Jennifer Logie uh, had, was the first executive medical officer of the new center in 1972. And uh, uh, certainly the whole direction of the program over the years, policies, procedures, services, and so on, have always involved that link to the pediatric society and to local mm -hmm. pediatricians. And so mm -hmm. if there's been one uh, major force of continuity, I think it's been the pediatricians locally. Yes and yeah. continues to be to this day. Yeah. You know, it's, the poison control movement has achieved some very substantial goals. I mean, you talked about the caustic ingestions, et cetera. In fact, if you look at data from last year, the number of deaths are virtually none now due to poisoning in the really? toddler age group. Um, and all this really is due to an effort that started in the mid-50s of education and uh, prevention and the application of, of good first aid medical knowledge, such as using Ipecac or seeking help in the emergency room. And uh, since many new exciting things have happened, people have forgotten just how much organizing poisoning into poison control centers has contributed to the well-being of children. Mm -hmm. There are still many things that, are not, uh, that we have not achieved. For one, one of the things we've done very well with toddlers and young infants, but one of the problems we're now seeing is the teenager, uh, both in terms of drug abuse and depression and suicide attempts with drugs. And the poison control movement has recognized that that's an area we need to focus in now. We've done quite well with children. It doesn't mean we're going to give up on them. The other thing that the poison control movement has done more recently is to recognize that the elderly are at risk mm -hmm. for um, side effects of drugs as well as poisoning. And that's another area of focus. And uh, so what's happened is, is since the 50s, I think we've achieved many goals that, that you set out to achieve for children. But the Academy of the, the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology and the Poison Control Centers now realize that we've got other goals that we need to achieve. I might just add that I find intriguing uh, at Children's Hospital today, for instance, there's a great interest in uh, trying to prevent trauma and trauma-related injuries and deaths. And when you talk with, uh, with the surgeons, Dr. Garcia and others, as to how they plan to do this, it is very, very similar to what the poison control movement did in the 50s and 60s. They want to establish databases. They want to go out and educate the public. And in fact, I think the trauma services could benefit in looking at how the poison control movements uh, progressed over the years. Because now, again, another unmet need in, in pediatrics, if you will, is trauma, morbidity, and mortality. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever I listen to them, I'm, I'm just amazed at how many parallels they're drawing to the poison control movement. Um, and well, I think it's very interesting. Uh, excuse me for no, interrupting. Know because <clears throat> I, I, it emphasizes it so much. Two of the things in particular, I'm at the age now, where the um, problem in older people, uh, since I have a regular list of drugs that I take now, and don't think, you don't stop and think, now, did I take this, didn't I take, exactly. not take it? Mm -hmm. Or if I get a reaction, is it because I took another pill that I shouldn't take, and things of that sort. And I read more and more about mm -hmm. it, which I never did before until mm -hmm. it applied to me. So I'm glad you mentioned that. 
and brought it up. And the second thing, that, of course, that again, you gather that my personal reaction involvement is shivering, so I get a shiver <laughs> about it because I happen to uh, disagree with the thing that they're doing now. I think that all bicycles should face traffic and not go with traffic. Uh, I think there's, I personally have had the experience of almost hitting kids who veer out in front mm -hmm. of me, you know, when they're going with me, whereas coming, that's the way it was when mm -hmm. I was riding bicycles. Mm -hmm. And helmets, you know, we do that too. It's not on poison control, but it's the same mm -hmm. principle. So I'm so glad yeah. you brought those two things up. Yeah, which yeah. reminds me, in fact, that the Academy of Pediatrics has a committee on poisoning and injury prevention. Really? I mean, the Academy sees us uh, having very, very common goals. And perhaps what we should do is in the next 20 or 30 years in Cincinnati, probably form a closer link with our trauma colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, because these, our goal really is to prevent preventable morbidity and mortality in children. Um, it's, it's very interesting. You mentioned Ipecac several times. And uh, in the 19, early 1980s, what happened is uh, pediatricians had, had traditionally manned and worked in poison control centers. But in the early 1980s, another branch of medicine became very interested, and that was the emergency medicine physicians. Um, clearly, for the reasons that they tend to see the adult equivalent of what we tended to see in the emergency department is where you probably see 80 percent of acute poisoning. And um, the focus has sort of shifted a little bit. I would say in the 1970s, almost all poison centers in this country were um, ha had pediatricians as their medical directors. Today, I would hazard guess that about 25% are mm. headed by pediatricians, and 75% have emergency medicine physicians as their medical directors. Um, the reason I mention this is it, it's interesting because right now the issue of Ipecac is, is a little controversial. A few studies in the mid-80s showed that there was really no need to give every patient who by history had ingested a poison Ipecac. Um, and the adult physicians have really, in some ways, misinterpreted this study. And uh, there, some, of, some of our colleagues in, in the adult field are beginning to suggest that Ipecac may be dangerous. I think what you mentioned is key here. Ipecac should not be given to everybody. There are certain instances where it should not be given. Uh, and unfortunately, I guess being a pediatrician, I get very, very disturbed when I hear my adult colleagues taking the, the tack that Ipecac is dangerous. Unfortunately, because they came into the game so late, they don't realize how much Ipecac has achieved in saving lives over the years. And I hope some of our adult colleagues get a chance to listen to, to you to hear of the impact of Ipecac and not merely to dismiss it um, simply because they came into the game very late. And the pediatricians have emphasized that you shouldn't be used all the time. You remember in my discussion I said a fourth of a teaspoon, a half a teaspoon, half, emphasizing that we have told the patient, the mother, I call all parents patient, the mother, that you don't always use it. You make sure, if you're not sure, you call here. Mm -hmm. And also, you don't always give a whole lot. So there, we educate them to it. Mm -hmm. So I think we're trying to realize that it isn't a lifesaver for everything, mm -hmm. saying, you know. Exactly. One of the points that fascinated me and the reason I brought up the uh, issue of the Kettering Laboratory from the very early days is that I think Cincinnati has been somewhat unique historically in the interest of occupational and environmental uh, physicians in the whole area of poison control. In fact, back in the early 1980s, uh, Dr. Susskind came back to us and said, I'd really like to help you create a 24-hour physician on-call service for what I think is a growing area of concern, and that is workers and employers and people concerned about environmental toxicology and chronic exposures to various substances. And as we all know, that's becoming an even greater concern uh, at the present time. And so since the uh, early 1980s, we have had a 24-hour group of physician fellows in environmental uh, and occupational health who are backed up by the faculty of what was the Kettering program, now the Department of Environmental Health, 
and that program continues today, many poison centers around the country are getting interested in that area, and their way of handling it uh, varies from center to center. But I think it was a first, uh, going all the way back to the days in which you chaired the committee and the involvement in of the... 1956. Uh, exactly. It's just we didn't give the seed the right uh, uh, growth process to, <laughs> to right. grow. The other thing I would yeah. want to mention, just uh, as a piece of uh, history, although the videotape goes into uh, some of this, is that time period of the Academy's involvement to the beginning of the current Drug and Poison Information Center's involvement, mm -hmm. because there's some question as to what really happened at that time period. L let me tell you what my initial involvement was. That back in 1966, uh, I was asked to establish the Drug Information Center as a service for physicians at the University Hospital. But uh, I had been trained early uh, in, con in poison control in Oregon and Dr. Susskind had recommended when I graduated that I should come to Cincinnati. I thought that was the end of my poison control interest, but a few years later, uh, I was approached by Dr. Logie, who had been contacted by Dr. Pratt, and now I know that Dr. Pratt had been contacted by the Pediatric Society, regarding the need to do something about poison control. This was at a time in which Dr. Hugo Smith had just left as director of the emergency room at Children's Hospital, uh, the house staff had just changed rotation, and the phone started ringing in the emergency room with poison control inquiries, and nobody was certain why, number one, or number two, what to do with those calls. And it became apparent that the Academy of Medicine had discontinued providing a service, and Dr. Pratt asked us if we would um, explore the possibility of having the Drug Information Center assume the responsibility for handling poison control in addition. And that's how we got involved in the poison control area back in uh, 1972. Could someone please help me? My two-year-old just drank from the toilet bowl. Yeah, um, my friend has these green and yellow pills, and I was just wondering if it'd be okay if he took them. This is Dr. Marks. I have a new patient who's been taking about 150 million. The Cincinnati Drug and Poison Information Center has been answering questions like these, handling serious drug and poison emergencies, and saving lives for 25 years now. The center has evolved into an essential part of our community's emergency service and drug prevention infrastructure. It began very humbly. With a modest little announcement in the UC Medical Center newsletter, listed way down at the bottom among the special programs of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology, read this announcement. A drug information center, under the direction of Leonard Siegel, has been established to make information about drugs more readily available to attending physicians, medical students, and nurses. It was October 1966, a quarter century ago. But the fates and changing times were conspiring to push the Drug Information Center into a far larger role. Tucked away in a closet on the fourth floor of an old wing at General Hospital, the center had handled over 400 calls its first year, mostly from hospital staff. But the center wouldn't be hidden away for long. Cincinnati's police and juvenile courts had learned of it, and they were hungry for knowledge, not so much of pharmaceuticals as had been imagined, but of street drugs. The center was embarked on Arrow One. After all, it was the 60s, and a hippie generation with its drug scene was becoming part of US life, even in conservative Cincinnati. So the Drug Information Center came out of the closet, and Dr. Len Siegel and the center became involved with a new free clinic in Clifton, providing treatment and information for drug abuse for the so-called counterculture. The mural on the free clinic wall was symbolic of the pot and acid era. The young center would be a life-saving force for the overdosed and a voice for drug prevention, both at the free clinic and behind the phones at General Hospital. Point man for the center and its emerging new role was an unlikely Cape Crusader, a dedicated young doctor of pharmacology, Dr. Len Siegel. More at home in the research lab and behind the phones at the center than on the streets, 
He became the key source for the community's TV and news media when the question was about the city's drug scene or drug abuse. While drugs were a priority in its early years, a call for facts and knowledge about toxicology was also emerging. As many as 10 poison information calls a day were being handled in children's hospital emergency room, even in these early days. The need to handle these critical calls for help appropriately led to the next era in the evolution of the Cincinnati Drug and Poison Information Center. The center was broadening its focus dramatically. It was moving into the mainstream of the community service infrastructure, becoming the voice of poison prevention and drug prevention, a focus based on academic strength and tested by on-the-streets practice. It was 1972. And with the financial support of the Hamilton County Mental Health Board, the Drug Information Center became the Cincinnati Drug and Poison Information Center. And its goal and lineage is well spelled out in this old office sign. Dr. Jennifer Logie was the co-founder and executive medical officer of the new DPIC. The expanded DPIC was a unique network. It combined drug information at General Hospital with poison control at Children's and the VA Hospital. And joining the DPIC staff at this time was Dr. Don Nelson, who continues as an associate director. From the beginning, the center sought unique ways to provide service. Through a TV network established at DPIC, the center was able to broadcast drug overdose or poison treatment information to regional hospitals, including Brown and Claremont County, Bethesda North, and Mercy in Hamilton. A new consumer hotline promoted widely by the center overwhelmed DPIC its first year, generating over 16,000 calls, an increase of over 40 times its first year level. By 1977, the center was pressed to the wall in its tiny office in General Hospital. Consumer calls had boomed to 37,000, and the center had proven its value as a life-saving emergency service with 81% of its calls coming from the public and over 7,500 from the professional medical community. The center was at a crossroads, and it moved to a new office and a new era. On June 12, 1978, DPIC officially opened a new location on the bridge of the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. The Hoffman LaRoche Foundation helped establish the new center. DPIC honored its generosity dedicating the new suite to its local rep, Bill Lively. With a strong network in place, the center began its new era, consolidating its strength behind an extensive outreach effort in drug abuse and poison prevention, from programs to reach the elderly, with gentle reminders to seniors on the proper use of prescriptions, to slightly more graphic illustrations, the center's focus became prevention. In this period, DPIC established and confirmed its reputation as one of the nation's premier poison control centers. Hotline telephone contacts continued to increase and total services provided by the center rose about 50,000 in 1983. DPIC was coming of age. Its expertise and capacity was greatly expanded because of the willingness of volunteer physicians, toxicologists, scientists, and member hospitals to become part of its 24-hour on-call team. The center was entering another new era of expanding community service. In 1984, DPIC was certified as a regional poison control center, further validating its role as the region's expert voice and consultant for drug and poison information. Its outreach services continue to focus on preventive programs, with DPIC staff making over 200 talks and health fair presentations. DPIC's 24-hour hotline and expertise has made it an important information center for critical community programs such as CASA, where the cooperative effort has been mutually beneficial. DPIC is also a source of strength for important new groups such as Parents for Education Against Inhalant Abuse. The center has also launched other significant services, such as the new Ohio Prevention and Education Resource Center, brought to Cincinnati by DPIC's associate director, Don Nelson, who will direct it. Its expertise has also made DPIC a contract consultant to a number of major corporations. Even as its services to our community and the Southwest Ohio region continue to increase, 
a community advisory board of interested and influential community citizens and professionals are helping chart new courses, energizing and challenging DPIC as it reaches its 25th milestone. For DPIC, the trip from its home on the bridge at the medical center to its future is still evolving, and one person is best able to capture its past and frame a direction for its future. The program is unique in the country. There's really no other program like it in the sense that there's one telephone number to call for a whole wide variety of concerns involving people and substances. Everything from drug abuse to medication use to poison control to technical information for health professionals to occupational and environmental toxicology concerns and so on and so forth. The agency has a history of responding to needs of the public because the public has received the message that if they don't know where to turn for help or if there is no place to turn for help, try the DPIC and somebody will help. Thanks to you, the friends of DPIC, for the support that has made our first 25 years possible. We're starting toward year 50, and we still need your help. Going through a little of the history very briefly, I just showed this picture of how we handled that uh, in those days that we had daytime hours covered by full-time staff, uh, widely uh, promoting the telephone number. But at night, uh, the calls were handled in the emergency room at Children's Hospital by the residents with some degree of orientation and training. But Dr. Doyne would be the first to tell you um, there was a lot of anxiety when somebody would call a teenager who had used LSD or something else. And it wasn't the typical pediatric accidental poisoning situation now that drug abuse was a bigger problem. And there was a desire on the part of the pediatricians working in the emergency room, the residents working in the emergency room, to really see if we could formalize this structure and get more expertise available as the nature of poisonings and the scope of poisonings was uh, changing. I already mentioned uh, the occupational area that came into it. Nationwide, there was a growing movement towards regionalization of poison centers. And uh, we noticed that there were about 15 poison centers in Ohio at that time, uh, but no standards uh, and no consistency between what was being done. The whole question of who gives advice to treating physicians regarding the complicated suicide cases, the uh, cases that uh, involve very serious intoxication, or who manages those individuals was now becoming an issue nationwide. And what happened? basically at that time was all of these departments got together and formed another committee. I guess one might call it the second poison control committee in a sense. We had people from the Drug and Poison Information Center. Dr. Erwin Hannonson was heading uh, the clinical toxicology program at that time, dealing mostly with adult toxicology issues. Uh, the Department of Pharmacology and Cell Biophysics, Pediatrics, Children's Hospital, Internal Medicine, Emergency Medicine, Environmental Health, Tox Laboratories, and all of the hospitals in Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati formed a member <coughs> hospital network of which they are all still members and still provide some support. But they looked at what do we really need to do moving into the future in poison control and I'll say with my esteemed colleague sitting next to me, one of the things that happened at that very same time period was a decision to bring Dr. Wasson to Cincinnati, who brought with him specialized training in medical toxicology, a new area uh, and discipline. And since then, others have joined him. I would mm -hmm. like to have him describe uh, what has happened since that time. But I think where we are now, because of those changes, is that we can look at poison control as being both a service to the public and through the expertise of these toxicologists to the treating physician treating very difficult cases and also mm -hmm. therefore to the public and it's a yeah. new direction in poison control and maybe you could yeah. explore that with us. I, I think what became apparent is that clinical toxicology became a very complicated sophisticated field and um, in the mid-70s, it became clear that for general 
physicians to have it as an interest was probably not enough. You needed to have some expert training. And as a result, several fellowship programs in clinical toxicology were set up across the country. Um, the premier one perhaps being at the Rocky Mountain Poison Control Center in Denver. Uh, in 1982, when I came to Cincinnati, um, I had just finished my training in clinical toxicology in addition to pediatrics, and certainly Len and I started to work together. But I must recognize Dr. Irv Hannanson, who in 1984 uh, realized that the clinical toxicology activities could be improved in, at the university hospital and at Children's Hospital. And what he did was to try and get a group of uh, physicians from Children's Hospital to start working with a group of physicians from the emergency medicine department. Um, Dr. Jim Roberts was a board certified uh, toxicologist who worked in the adult emergency department. I worked in the pediatric emergency department. He coordinated our activities with the Drug and Poison Control Center and he also got other parties interested. He got internal medicine involved and he continued the collaboration of occupational medicine. We started to meet weekly to discuss cases and share information with each other in addition to providing the 24-hour coverage in terms of physician backup for the poison lines. Um, and what's evolved really since that time is that both the emergency medicine department and pediatrics have started to collaborate very strongly. And in 1985, we actually started a fellowship program uh, in clinical toxicology here in Cincinnati. Um, we are probably one of 12 or 13 such programs in the country. We believe that the training that our fellows get is uh, second to none because we have an extensive volume uh, of patients to deal with. The research program is, is gathering steam. And I must currently recognize the um, input of uh, Dr. Um, Mel Auden from Emergency Medicine, uh, who has uh, set up the emergency component since Dr. Roberts' uh, departure. And uh, uh, we now have an active fellowship. We've graduated uh, three fellows so far. And I think the future f looks good. I think we are all going to work together and hopefully establish uh, a more collaborative program. If there's one area in which we could be strengthened, I think, is basic research. I think we're doing very well with, with the clinical aspects of the program but we need to start to work with some basic research issues in clinical toxicology. Both of you mentioned something that I think I ought to give for recording here, is when the hospitals, myself through the Jewish Hospital and Don Frank through the Good Samaritan started the pediatric departments, who was most helpful and instrumental in getting the uh, children's hospital was Ashley Weech. Mm -hmm. And I do want to mention his name because he was that kind of a person, really, and went out of his way to see that we were given access to various, um, any we needed at Children's Hospital. Very, very cooperative and helping in starting. This was in, I'm talking now about the late 50s, early 60s, is um, when Ashley was here at that time, and he was very, very cooperative. Both of you mm -hmm. mentioned about children's involved in starting, and I thought mm -hmm. I hadn't mentioned him, and I think mm -hmm. I should have. Well, I want to thank uh, you, Dr. Klein and Dr. Wasson, for joining me for this historical review of what has happened in terms of poison control over the last many years in Cincinnati. And we're going to be ending this videotaping today with a two-minute prepared video also shown at the 25th anniversary uh, dinner, a vision of the future of poison control and drug information services in Cincinnati. We want to thank you very much for uh, joining us, and thank you for watching. We're looking pretty good today. Uh, we are going to get warmer than yesterday. We were at 68. Normal high is 70. We'll be in the low 70s today under partly sunny skies. A few more clouds. Any way you look at it, it's a beautiful city. It's a great place to live and raise a family. But there can be a thin line between its beauty and its bad side. Between a day at play
and a tragic moment of negligence. Drug and poison information, can I help you? For 25 years, Cincinnati's Drug and Poison Information Center has been responding to our community's emergencies, reaching out with information, alerting our community to new dangers, providing expert consultation, acting as a community balancing force between the harsh reality of poison accident, drug overdose, and the serenity of Cincinnati. Until there's a drug-free world, until there's a poison-proof home, there is the Drug and Poison Information Center. To preserve our medical history, Children's Hospital Medical Center has produced a series of interviews with distinguished medical faculty. 